forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance, the exodus of my heart. You found me, you freed me, held back the waters from my release. Oh, yeah. Guiding lights to my feet, you found me, you found me, you freed me, held back the waters from my release. Oh, yeah. in when we were hopeless and helpless. Hey, you can have a seat for a moment. We have some announcements. And Pastor George Kellerman. All right. Good to see everybody this evening. Welcome. Uh, we got some things coming up we want to take note of. Tomorrow, there's a Coffee and Connect. 
from the 9.30 to 10.30 hour. That's for new folks. And so if you know somebody uh, that needs to be there, uh, some of the staff and elders can be there to help them get a little um, acclimated to our church, get some information about it. Um, we have the Freedom Float happening tomorrow. This is a reschedule. It'll start, we'll meet out here um, under the awning at 12.30 and head to Morrill to uh, get in the water. So you've got to have some floating device, all right, kayak or tubes or whatever you've got. Life jackets are required. Life jackets are required. Um, but there'll be lunch uh, before the float. And so um, make sure you're part of that. should be fun. It's not going to be 107 degrees anyway. doesn't look like it tomorrow. Um, fall classes are starting in September, but you need to get signed up now. And so our core classes are coming. September 11th is when those will start. So make sure you get signed up and registered for those. The equip class, which Pastor Luke is going to be teaching, starts that same uh, Sunday. And so make sure you check out on Planning Center and get signed up into those. Um, Awana is coming up. Registration is open right now. You can register your kids through the Planning Center app or Church Center app. And then um, registration night, September 11th. If you want to come, bring your kids, get registered. You can get um, materials that weekend um, or that night, excuse me. So that's September 7th. Um, so be here for that. And then I want to kick off is September 14th. And that's when you get your stuff Okay, all your Awana stuff. So um, make note of those. Um, this year, Awana, we're expanding a little bit. Fifth and sixth grade is going to be um, uh, have their separate club. We're still part of Awana, but that's an exciting um, addition there um, for, this, for this year. So anyway, those are the announcements. Also ways to give. If you're new here, we have boxes in the back or you can give online. We also um, have, let's see, an elder an, uh, update on our building and a lot of things. So Kevin, come on up and... Get us updated. Is this on? Okay. Hi, for you who uh, do not know me, I'm Kevin Burton, uh, one of the new elders. Uh, seems like Jamie and I uh, have got a lot of experience in the last five, six months. Uh, we didn't realize how committed our co-elders are and how they've encouraged us to do that. Uh, we want to remind you that we've had a search committee uh, that's been working diligently to find us a uh, children's director, youth pastor, maybe a family pastor. And in that search, uh, they've came up with a candidate for us. Uh, Dan and Amy, if you'd just hold your hand up. Uh, we've actually uh, started the interview process with them. They will be teaching a little bit for... Uh, tomorrow in the education hour between services with some youth and then tomorrow evening with some youth and some parents and meeting them now. Uh, so we appreciate the opportunity for them to come up and spend some time with us. And it's always good. We got to hear their testimony and, and uh, I just always like to hear that from fellow Christians. So um, try to make them welcome. We should be on our best behavior. The other uh, announcement we want to talk about is the ongoing worship center project that we've got going on with the bricks. I hope you did notice all the work that's been taking place. and We think what's been done looks really well, and we think it will uh, work really well, which is the most important. Uh, we ask that on the front end of this, if you remember, we asked you to prayerfully consider uh, making charitable contributions over and above your normal giving. And we want you to do that being spirit-led, as the spirit leads you give. Uh, so far, we have received $43,000 of contributions for that. And that's a big woo-hoo, so thank you guys. The original pro uh, project, we had, if you remember, we projected it to be about $300,000. Uh, that allowed us some opportunities, some wiggle room to make some uh, changes to the plan and and as all construction projects go changes that end up having to be made uh, so we had a little bit of room for that uh, currently our anticipated cost of the building project itself is about three hundred and fifteen thousand dollars as of today what we have dispersed on the project so far is a hundred and ten thousand dollars so we have a lot that's going to be 
still going out of the church coffers and, and uh, to pay for the project. Uh, we would anticipate a very large check going out because the first of the month came, it's time for a progress billing, I'm sure, and we'll be seeing that. In addition to that building project, what we've come across is uh, we also have uh, uh, to change some elevations around the church, and we're looking to decide and, and investigate in, into it how the best way to accomplish that would be. Uh, first and foremost is uh, most efficient and effective, but also uh, a financially responsible way to do that. Uh, we also wanted to remind you that the, of the program with the fire suppression system here that we had the pump that went bad uh, and it's going to, it is in, it's been delivered to the vendor, we'll have it installed shortly other than we've been informed that we have a problem, electrical problem with the service and we have to provide service, redo the electrical service to the pit, which is the pits. So. Uh, it's going to cost probably about $35,000 for that. I throw big numbers around. I don't take them lightly. Uh, but the Lord has blessed us. And uh, just ask that you would continue to, to bless us too. In Jesus' name. Nope. Didn't turn it off. Good. Well, hello, everybody. My name is James Adams. I'm missions director here at Mitchell Berean, and I have some exciting news. In two weeks, uh, my wife, Jesse, and I, and Travis and Nikki Ray are going to be heading to Wolzenheisen, Switzerland. Um, we're going to be visiting Scott and Monty Langmeyer um, right up there. It's Scott, Monty, and their three beautiful little daughters. And um, we're going to be spending a week up there um, working with them. And uh, Scott and Monty are with uh, Movita International, and what Movita is, is an international inter <laughs> interdenominational church organization um, working globally to motivate young people to grow in their personal relationships with Jesus by training them to use their gifts and talents to better serve their local churches and in world missions. And the Langmeers train and mentor people from all over the world. Um, they go into Switzerland, they do uh, so many months, and then they're sent out back to the local churches or into missions. Um, which brings us to our trip. And one of the things we're going to be doing in our trip is um, working with them. They are renovating um, their entire training center, which their training center dates back like a couple hundred years. Uh, this is Europe. Uh, this is, a, you know, a couple hundred years in America. That'd be pretty cool. But uh, back then, it's not a big deal. Um, as you can see, they're completely gutting it. They had some uh, damage, some water damage. Um, and then also, Europe during COVID, if you guys remember, completely shut down. Like, you weren't able to go outside. You weren't able to do anything. So this is uh, two years of basically neglect. And um, part of that trip that we're going to do is uh, kind of being helpful to maintain their training centers. You can see like they went down to the complete foundation and uh, Scott was like, yeah, some of these bricks are like 200 years old. <laughs> and I'm like, that's awesome, but you know, it's not gonna be easy. So that's gonna be part of the trip is just helping them start and uh, get a better, you know, we're gonna just bang out some walls and some more concrete, it's gonna be great. And um, number two is just, Building relationships with our missionaries, that's our goal as a missions team. Uh, we've been supporting Scott and Monty for several years, and uh, they're very excited for us to come out and spend some time and that we can see what Christ is actually doing um, with them. And, um, but this is why this is so important. We have care groups, and I've talked about this before, um, NBC Mission Care Groups, and um, if you guys could be a part of their care group uh, during this time, that would be amazing. And you just simply go onto the Connect app, you scroll down to groups, and then you'll have the picture of them under missions. And uh, then you just uh, click on that, and then you put support, or I think it's like uh, member or whatever. Um, but that, that would really be beneficial, uh, seeing this church come together behind them. Um, 
um, as we go over there. And then third, which is the, the fun part, um, is we are preparing uh, for a much bigger trip. Uh, this time next year, we're wanting to take the congregation over there, a group from our church, and we're wanting to help them rebuild um, the facility that you saw. And there's a few other buildings that we're going to help uh, rebuild as well. Um, but we're also just going to kind of have, like, get a better understanding of what we need to do um, and uh, what the cost is and different things of that nature. We'll have a better plan when we get back here in a couple of weeks. And then we'll make an official announcement inviting you as a congregation to go on that trip. Um, probably it'll be next year. So if you could just pray for us, uh, myself, my wife, Jesse, and then Travis and Nikki Ray that are going with us, that we just have a safe and easy trip, uh, that everything goes well, and uh, we just have a great time. So thank you. One of the Beatles wants to sing on stage here. <laughs> hey, would you stand? Would you read God's word with me? Um, I'm going to read from 1 Peter chapter 2. You can read this with me. Let's praise and thanks God for his work on the cross. He never sinned nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. That's 1 Peter chapter 2. Praise God. Thank God for taking our wounds, shedding his blood on our behalf. Sing with me.
mystery Your faithfulness has walked beside me The winter storms made way for spring In every season from where
worship you in all your splendor, your character, your justice, and yet your love. And our salvation is the perfect marriage of your justice and your love. Where justice was satisfied and love was poured out, we just stand in awe and re realize and recognize that we do not have the strength to save ourselves or to walk the Christian walk alone. God, show us how desperately we need to depend on you, to lean on you. Renew our minds, make them new, wash them with your word today. We pray this in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. Good evening, everybody. It's good to see you. A little bit hot there on the mic, but um, we're starting a new series um, this month called Heal. And part of this series is getting ready for our kickoff of Celebrate Recovery. And some of you may have been a part of this um, at our church before, but Celebrate Recovery focuses on three things, hurts, hangups, and habits. And hurts could be any sort of trauma, um, emotional, spiritual, physical that we've had um, that has continued to affect us. Or um, habits could be a sort of an addiction or something that's a repeating cycle in your life. Or hangups of, um, I like to call life dominating problems. Things that are always hanging around um, your life and really start to take control over time. So we're gonna look at Romans um, chapter 12. And we're going to break this down into three sections and we're going to talk about um, surrender and how important it is to find surrender and the renewing of our mind when it comes to um, healing. Number two, we're going to talk about being focused on other people, of serving others and serving God as our primary focus. Um, number three, we're going to talk about forgiveness. And finally, we're going to talk about the sovereignty of God and how God's sovereignty is essential um, in our process of healing. But the question I have for us as we get into this is when you've experienced real pain in your life, it's really tempting um, to go to the world to cope and go to the world um, to feel better. Because when we get in, into real pain, and I'm, I'm not downplaying, you know, when our dog dies or when we, um, our car breaks down. I know those things have real pain in our lives. But when you get to the, the heartbreaking, the gut-wrenching, um, that, that thing that you held dearest in your life and that gets taken away from you, you know, how do you and I actually deal with that pain? And a lot of times I know for myself, I experienced a season where um, when you're in that kind of pain, you get desperate. It's like if I could do anything to feel better, if I could do anything to block this out of my mind, um, I would do that. And sometimes that anything can start to be things of the world and can even be sinful things so we don't know how to cope. And I went through a season, and this is um, maybe redundant for some of you who were at the... Um, 
the service at the fair, but I want to share it again um, this week. Of, I went through a season about a year and a half ago of some hangups in my life that were going unaddressed over time through my time in ministry um, that were producing anxiety at times, depression. And I was kind of in denial that, you know, strong Christians don't ha- uh, struggle with depression. And if you're really trusting Christ, you can't really have anxiety. And so I was pushing those feelings off, pushing those feelings off until finally um, I hit a, hit a brick wall. And it came to the point where there was something just wrong with me. I mean, I couldn't read. I would sit down to read my Bible and the room would spin and my anxiety would heighten. I couldn't sleep. Um, I lost about 35 pounds in the, in the span of probably oh, about three and a half years. And if you see me, I'm not that big of a person. And so imagine about 15, 20 more pounds off of me um, is, is where I was at. I couldn't keep food down. Um, and during that time, there was that loneliness and despair and hopelessness that starts to creep into our life. And during this season, there was really only one thing that kept me from, I think, totally losing it. And I know it might sound crazy. Maybe some of you guys have been there. But I, I told Sarah a couple of times, I think I may be on the verge of a mental breakdown. I don't know what mental breakdowns look like or what they feel like. But I don't know. It seems like what I'm experiencing has to be getting me pretty close to that. But there's a scripture in First John, if you'll turn there with me. And I think this will be on the screen. First John chapter 4. At this season of my life, I'd have to step away um, from the ministry. We had gone through a really challenging church split. And um, I was at home with our little guy, Stone, who was probably about six months at the time. My wife was working. And I was barely functional enough to watch Stone. And my mom would come down two or three days of the week from Scott's Fluff to give me a little bit of a reprieve so I didn't totally um, collapse. But um, 1 John chapter 4... Um, And it's verse 7 through 11, but I want to focus on verse 9, or sorry, verse 10. In verse 10, he says this, and this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the substitute or the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And this is a time in my life where when you're in that immense pain or hurt that hasn't healed in your life, a lot of times your self-worth, um, your hope, your drive, your zeal, your passion, your life just totally falls out. And the things that you used to love to do and the things you're excited about doing and even that nearness with God seems gone. And it was the first time in my life where I didn't, um, I didn't feel like I really had any communion with God. But it was this scripture as I would sit on my... Um, stairs and watch stone call, call around and, and cry as I would, um, I would recite this scripture to myself over and over and over. And this is love. Not that I love God. That if, my, if, if God's salvation for me was based upon my love for God, I was toast because I didn't have any emotion to, to stir up to actually give to God. I, I felt like I had nothing to give him. If it was my works, if it was my ministry, that was gonna please God, that had been taken away. If it was my ability to be a good husband and a good father and really be there for my wife and be there for my son, that seemed to be dissipating, that there didn't, didn't seem like there was anything that I could really give God for any reason why he would love me. But in this scripture, whether it was late at night, I couldn't sleep or um, the million trips to the restroom from my torn up stomach or whatever it would be, um, I would recite this scripture and this is love, not that I love God, that no matter how desperate and despairing and depressed I felt, there was a truth that I could count on that God loved me and he chose me despite of it. Before I chose God, before I wanted to follow Christ, while I was an enemy of God is when he, he loved me. And I'm blown away by the patience of Jesus Christ. When you think about, man, he rose people from the dead, he did miracles, he did all these things. And he rises from the dead and and two of his followers, you know, Mary and these women see that he's been risen from the dead. They speak to him. They come back to the disciples and they're saying, hey, Jesus Christ is alive. And they don't really, they don't believe him. They're, They're still discouraged. They're still despairing. Jesus comes and visits them. They all have a testimony. But who's the one guy who still doesn't believe? It's Thomas, right? And Jesus comes up to him and he says, I'm not going to believe unless I put my, my hands, my fingers into the holes in his hands and in his side. And Jesus met him where he was at. That there was, there was a part of me that there was parts of where I was at that was sinful. And there was a part of my discouragement and lack of faith that was sinful. But yet there was the patience and the long suffering of Christ that ultimately would lead me to healing. 
And the reason why I want to start with this is because Romans 12, if you're familiar with the book of Romans, Romans 12 is very practical. It gives us the day-to-day tools of how we should, should live our lives. It talks about um, our relationship with God, talks about our relationship with the world, talks about our relationship um, with our enemies, with the church, all these different areas, how we can relate to one another. But for the first 11 chapters, you know what Paul's doing? He's setting up for chapter 12. He's talking about the gospel. He's basically expounding on 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 11 that I just got done reading. That before Romans 12 can be impactful for you or be impactful for me, it has to come from a response to the gospel of Jesus Christ first. That Romans 12 isn't a self-help program. Celebrate recovery isn't a self-help program. That if we just do things out of the practical, because there's things about psychology that are true. People have studied and God has developed our our bodies in a very um, complicated way. But ultimately those things are never gonna get to actual healing in our heart, in our deepest wounds, our deepest hangups, our deepest habits. Um, But the gospel of Jesus Christ is what gets to that when everything else fails. And so after Paul has this overarching summary of the gospel, he's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles, how they're both um, guilty. He talks about our response by faith and our new identity and the victory we have in Christ and this ongoing battle between the flesh and the spirit. Eventually he gets to Romans 12. And if you'll turn there with me, we'll read our scripture for today. Romans verse, or chapter 12, um, verse 1 and 2. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, by, uh, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that which is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So one quick Bible tip. When you're reading the Bible, anytime, um, I think it was uh, Pastor Jake Roberts who taught me this, but um, anytime you see the word therefore, you can ask the question, what is the therefore, therefore? That there, when he says therefore, he's saying because of something I just got done explaining, therefore, I'm about to give you some advice or some tools or some direction. So again, he's saying therefore, by the mercies of God, because we've talked about how God has redeemed the Jews and the Gentiles. And if you read chapter 9 through 11, um, nine times he uses the phrase God's mercy. That he just got done talking about the sovereignty of God and the grace of God. And now he's saying because you have been impacted which is our first step, because you've been impacted by the mercies of God, therefore offer your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. So there's two ways that we're gonna find our healing. One is this living sacrifice, and two is the renewing of our mind. So when you guys hear the phrase living sacrifice, it sounds kind of funny, right? What, what comes to your mind when you, when you hear this phrase living sacrifice? Because in the Old Testament, the sacrifices were animals, right, that were slaughtered and killed. They, the, the sacrifices didn't live in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, our sacrifice being the atonement of Jesus Christ, now our life, our response to the mercy of God is a living, testifying sacrifice to him. It's our reasonable service is what the scripture says to give back to him. But the way I would define sacrifice in our sense is an act of complete worship or devotion to God, an act of complete worship and devotion to God. And that's why in the Old Testament, um, when they would do their sacrifices, they would ask for the best of the flock or the the first fruits um, that would be offered to the Lord because he didn't just want the leftovers, but he wanted their complete devotion, their complete sacrifice to God. And does anybody know, we got, a, we got a small enough group so you can raise your hand or shout it out if you want, but does anybody know the first place in the Old Testament that the word worship is used the first time, the story? Don't, don't put that up um, there yet, the, the scripture, because I'll give it away. But does anybody know in Genesis, first time, Old Testament? I think somebody does, but you probably just don't want to yell it out, which is fine. But um, it's Genesis chapter 22, um, verse five. And it's um, the story of Isaac and Abraham and Abraham being um, asked to offer his son Isaac up as a a sacrifice to God, to kill his son Isaac um, before the Lord. 
And if you turn to Genesis chapter 25, verse 5, Abraham has, has made his way to sacrifice his son. It says, Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, but Abraham, oh wait, that's, that's not the right scripture here. 22.5, sorry, Genesis 22.5. Um, Genesis 22.5, um, he says, and Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and the lad, and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. I think this is interesting because Abraham's been asked to sacrifice his one and only son. And when he's asked to explain what he's doing, he's saying, I'm going to worship. And this comes to, for us to be able to be living sacrifices to God, which is our reasonable service and is so important for us to get inner healing. What God is gonna ask us to, to sacrifice or what God is gonna ask us to worship is in the areas where it's hardest for us to do so. That it's great to pray, um, it's great to sing songs, that can be worship. It's great to tithe, give money, that can be worship. It's great to um, offer your time and your service, that can be worship. But what about when God asks you to give up, to sacrifice, to worship with that one thing that you're protecting? What happens when that's the thing that's most dear, dear to you that God is going to take away and ask you to worship and to give thanks and to, to display the testimony of Christ through extreme loss or extreme pain? Or maybe we've been hurt and we don't want to trust people. We're, we're tired of getting hurt from people in the church or we've gone through a divorce and we're never going to trust people again and we're protecting that one area of our life. You know, we'll give our money, we'll maybe preach sermons, we'll maybe talk to our neighbor about the Lord. But when it comes to actually being vulnerable and getting to the innermost healings in our hearts so we can connect to the Lord, we're pushing that off and we're hiding that, that we aren't willing to sacrifice or worship with what means the most to us. And so in Romans 12, when he says, we have to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice um, to God, this is ultimately saying we should be living an act of worship in everything that we do. And, you know, this was, um, this was really challenging for me. Um, you know, being, being an athlete, there's that... Um, performance that's just kind of ingrained in you as a, little, as a little kid if you're always doing things and you're expecting a result. In a lot of ways that I transferred over to my relationship with God and maybe for you that was trying to please a parent that was never happy with you or maybe it was trying to please a boss or whoever it was that, that people pleasing even before we're saved can even carry over after we have accepted Christ and began to follow him. There was a scripture that I felt like God led me to that was um, Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And he gets to Peter, and what does Peter say to Jesus when he wants to wash his feet? He says, no, can't do it. Don't do it. I want to wash your feet. But Jesus says, Peter, if you don't let me wash your feet, you have no part in me. And I believe that this is symbolic of, of Jesus. You know, I, have you ever had your feet washed? Raise your hand if you've had your feet washed by somebody. So we got a few. It's a little uncomfortable. It's a little uncomfortable. I've, I've, I've had it. And when I was in Kenya, we washed the feet of some of the um, villagers of, of the town that we were sponsoring kids to go to school and, and that had recently come to Christ. And so, you know, they're looking at us like we're these awesome pastors and stuff. And it was, it was kind of humiliating, honestly, for them to let us wash their feet because they felt so... Um, endeared or indebted to us, that they should be serving us. But for us to actually wash their feet, they, they didn't really want us to do that. But, you know, they allowed it. And there was a humility and a connection that happened within that. And when you're washing people's feet from Kenya, and they don't have shoes, and um, they don't have a lot of running water and things for baths, would have been similar to what the disciples experienced. It's a dirty experience, and it, it is kind of gross. And so when Jesus is washing these guys' feet, Peter's thinking, no way, this is... This is making me uncomfortable because I should be the one serving you. And so many times in our relationship with Christ, when we're hurt and when we have dirty things in our life, we want to clean them up. We want to make it right so then we can serve God. We want to make it right so then we can be a good Christian instead of letting Christ wash our feet. But the truth is, if we're not willing to, to let go of the, of the dirtiest, grossest, most secret places of our lives, Jesus says you can't have any part with him. There won't be any true intimacy. It's the same thing in marriage. If there's things um, couples are hiding from each other, I mean, you can be married, but you're not gonna be very close if there's always secrets and you won't be vulnerable with the things that you struggle with most. 
So part of being this, this living sacrifice is letting Jesus get down to the deepest, darkest parts of who we are. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 is a great scripture. Most of you will know this. He says, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. See, I've shared the principles of what a living sacrifice is, but ultimately, this, this goes to every part of our life. This isn't compartmentalizing church and work and whatever it is, but whether we eat or whether we drink, those are the two most simple tasks that we do, eating and drinking. But yet he's saying we can actually do these to the glory of God and do these in faith. So how, if we're supposed to live by faith and we're supposed to um, accept the grace of God and we can't earn God's favor, to me, sometimes it seems a little bit contradictive of you're supposed to be a living sacrifice, but don't work for it. You're supposed to devote yourself to God, but don't start to, to perform. It can seem kind of like, man, this seems to be kind of a tough tension um, to work with. But if you turn to Hebrews 11 with me here. Read verse 6. And he says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him, speaking of God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Romans 12 says that God's looking for living sacrifices that are holy and acceptable to him. But the good news for me and you is that holy and acceptable come by what? The only thing they can come by is Jesus Christ. The only thing they can come by is by faith in his grace and through faith that we can be found holy and acceptable before God. But when we're trying to hide our feet from Jesus and we're trying to not be vulnerable of, of what the real hurts and the hangups and the habits in our lives and people are gonna think we're not very good Christians and man, people wouldn't hang out with me if they knew this or God wouldn't love me if I was actually honest about what's going on. In the midst of this, our sacrifice is tainted. It's not something that can please God. But the moment that we just humble ourselves and say, Lord, I don't have anything to give you. There's no amount of works that I can give you, but yet by faith, we can find our sacrifice to be holy and acceptable because it's sanctified by Jesus Christ. And I know for me, this, this really hit home on um, the, one of the few things I could do that um, during the time where I was struggling so much physically, mentally, spiritually, was walking on the treadmill seemed to help um, a little bit and I was doing that one day and I felt so discouraged because I felt like in the midst of my hurt and maybe you've experienced this in the midst of your hurt or whatever your hang up is your habit it seems to be robbing your opportunity to obey God and fulfill your purpose for him and I felt like man my spirit is willing I want to go um, reach people who are in addictions I want to go plant churches I want to go preach the gospel um, I love doing all this stuff but physically I literally just couldn't I literally couldn't sit down and read my Bible I couldn't stand up and give a sermon I couldn't do these things because my body and my, my, my physical aspect of who I was was so shot my spirit was willing um, but my flesh was really weak I was just praying about this and, and just feeling like a failure before God. It's like, man, did I do something that took away my calling that I can't serve God in the way that I feel like I should be able to? And I felt like, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, it wasn't like an audible voice, but I just felt like God, as I was praying about this, so much highlighted um, the word call. You know, what, my calling, I felt like my calling was gone. Um, but all of a sudden I was reminded of the greatest commandment which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all of your strength. And all of a sudden I realized I hadn't lost my calling. That I could, I could be so depressed I couldn't get out of bed and I could not be in the ministry and I could be sick and I could have some terminal disease that doesn't get better. But no, nothing in the world, whether that be sin, whether that be the world, or whether that be the devil, nothing could take away my ability to love God, to know God, and to worship him. And all of a sudden, it's like as I'm walking on the treadmill, I, there was just this burst of tears and surrender. If I didn't realize my hangup was I needed to accomplish these things for God. And I needed to fulfill my call for God all the while I was missing the greatest call, which was simply to love God, to know him, to worship him, 
and whatever I did just to be surrendered to his plan. So my question for us, this, I want to say this morning, but tonight, is will we surrender our ability to try to fix things? That's something that you have to think about. Am I willing to surrender my desire to be control and always have to fix my own problems? Because if you're doing that, Jesus can't wash your feet. We can't be a living sacrifice and we're not gonna experience healing. Number two is distractions. A lot of people, when they're really su- suffering, they just distract themselves. Go on a million different vacations, have a million different hobbies, always are keeping busy with all these things. And sometimes you need to do that. Honestly, there was a time where I needed to keep myself busy um, to keep my mind off things. That's not always a bad thing, but we only can use that as a, a method to get to the true healing. But if that's our coping mechanism, just be busy for the rest of our lives, um, it's not gonna work. And um, self-medication, whatever that looks like, that could be video games, that could be sex addictions, that could be drugs, that could be codependent relationships. That could be a lot of things that we're self-medicating because we don't wanna feel the pain of what we're going for, um, or looking for. And finally is just your version of the truth that we have an opportunity that when you're in pain and especially if you've experienced depression, anxiety, there are so many lies you're believing. Just telling you, I've been there, but you are believing a lot of lies. And if you don't let the word of God help you discern what is true and what is false, you will drive yourself crazy and you'll get more and more anxious and you'll get more and more depressed. And I finally, um, Steve Levitt was a, a Christian counselor I was working with and I was explaining to him all the things I felt like that could go wrong um, from what I was experiencing and my fears. And, um, and he said lovingly, so what? I was like, so what? Well, then this would happen and this would happen and that would affect this person, that would affect that person. And he said, Luke, you know, you have to learn to, to accept the worst case scenario. You have to learn that you can't control and you can't fix and um, you can't have your own version of what the solution is. God's ways are higher than our ways. And sometimes we just have to go day by day, second by second, by faith, just trusting that. Man, even if the worst possible thing that I can think of happens in my life, I can still love God. I can still know him. I can still worship him. And I can still have peace because ultimately he's in control. So with that... um, I want to close with this, this topic of renewing your mind. And in Romans 12, he talks about not only will we offer our body as a living sacrifice, but we have to renew our mind. And I'm going to give a, a little uh, uh, analogy that I found really helpful for me of a picture. And um, I don't know if you've ever done anything that required muscle memory, um, whether that be lifting weights, whether that be um, riding a bike, whether that be, I don't know, doing knitting or something that you've done for a long time and then you haven't done it forever, you go back to it and it's like right away your body remembers how to do that thing. Do you know your brain works exactly the same way? And there's some things that I'm not gonna get all into a whole psychology lesson here, but there's one thing I wanna share that I think is fascinating that the Holy Spirit wrote this through Paul 2000 years ago. Because up till recent history, they thought your brain after about the age of 30 couldn't change. That whatever um, brain structure and neurons that have, and, and neurological pathways that have been developed, that was just it. That's the way your brain was gonna be. So if you had a mental illness or you had an addiction, the best you could do was just cope with it for the rest of your life. But what they found out recently is that your brain's malleable and that your brain can literally change its structure over time with repeated behavior, no matter how old you are. But it takes very specific discipline. And this Christian neuroscience uh, scientist explained it this way, that if you have positive thoughts that are focusing on the truth of God and focusing on others and, and letting your control go, it's like a healthy tree. And what do healthy trees do for our environment? right, that they create a healthy environment. It's oxygen, all these, always, always these movements to plant more trees, right? Because it's, it's good for the air, it's good for our environment. But on the opposite side of things, when we have thought patterns that are stress and worry and control and fear, those things are producing basically neurons that are like dead trees, rotten trees. And they're producing rotten things into the environment, rotten things into your brain that over time take a toll on your mental, physical, emotional health. If you turn with me to Hebrews chapter five, there's three things that are really important when we talk about renewing our mind um, that I wanna talk about. Let 
In Hebrews chapter five, verse seven and eight, he says, I'm talking about Jesus. And I'm actually um, gonna read this one out of the NLT because I think it says it a little better here. Um, It says, while Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things that he suffered. Jesus, the son of God, did what? He learned obedience. It wasn't something that just happened. See, the process of renewing our mind is a process. So if you read your Bible for like a week or tried to think positive for a week and it hasn't worked, well, because it doesn't work that way. Just like the bad habits you've developed, you've probably been doing them for years. And what I found is the bad habits that had been leading me to thoughts of anxiety, leading me to burnout um, in the ministry, those are bad habits I'd been doing since basically I'd been saved. And so if it took seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years to develop a bad habit, it's gonna take time for God to, un- now he can bring peace and he can bring healing at some level and God can do miracles where all of a sudden he turns us around. But most of the time, just like Jesus, he's gonna ask us to learn obedience through the process of suffering for us to receive healing. Second scripture, I wanna to turn to Philippians um, chapter four. This one I also want to read out of the NLT. Um, It's a pretty famous scripture. And he says, um, Philippians chapter four, verse 11. He says, not that I I was ever in need, for I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it was with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Again, Paul, the apostle Paul, who had raised people from the dead and been in prison and started revivals, he says what? That he learned to be content. It wasn't something that happened overnight, but this renewing of his mind, this constant meditation of the scripture, this constant putting his faith towards Christ over time renewed his mind so that he could be content no matter what came his way. So number one, I think that's so important about this is getting out of the victim mentality. None of us are victims. I'm not saying you haven't been victimized at some point in your life. We can be the recipient of some very hard things. People can manipulate us, people can hurt us. But ultimately, Jesus Christ didn't leave us a victim. You're no longer a victim. That God has chosen you, he's purchased you with his own blood, that Jesus Christ is giving you a chance for new identity. That whenever we're in that cycle of I'm the victim, I'm always the one who's being hurt, I'm the one that no one appreciates, it's not true. Maybe people don't. But God does, and God sent his only son, and he bled and died for you so that you could have a new identity in him. So number one, as we learn to be content in in all things, we have to realize that we're not the victim. Number two is this truly is a a life or death thing. This isn't something that, again, we can just do here or there. Think about if you were a soldier, and that's really what we are. We are soldiers um, in the, the army of Christ. If you were in combat, you can't all of a sudden think, you know, I feel a little discouraged today. I'm just gonna sit down and play a video game while um, all of a sudden the bullets are firing from every direction, right? I'm not saying you can never play a video game, but that'd be ridiculous, right? If you're in the middle of war, you can't just stop and take a break. That there's an aspect of, I'm not talking about being hyper-legalistic, but there's an aspect of whatever we do, whether we eat, whether we drink, whether we work out, whether we're tying our shoes, are we always keeping in mind that I'm here to glorify God and I'm here to um, represent him. I want to read Ephesians um, chapter 6 verse 10. And this is the armor of God. And um, for those of you at the, the fair service, I encourage you to do this or maybe that was... Um, the Unite deal, but um, one thing that I did during the season is every morning I prayed through the armor of God. Um, and I would just sit down and take me five, 10 minutes and I would pray and I would meditate on, this is what I'm about. I'm about to engage in a spiritual battle today. And I'm already at a disadvantage because I feel anxious, I feel depressed, I can't read my Bible. So I'm gonna start with at least meditating and memorizing on um, the scripture and knowing that um, I have a spiritual battle I have to face. And I think a lot of times spiritual battles can t- get taken out of context in the sense of like become very complicated. Like, oh, I've got to fight a demon and what does this look like? 
how God tells us to fight spiritual warfare is really simple. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna read it right now in, in um, chapter t- or six, verse 10. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Now, this is what we do. We stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. That was preparation. You gird your waist before you went into battle. So every day, when you wake up, girding your, your waist, girding your mind with the word of God to prepare you um, for your day. Number two, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. My righteousness does not come from my works. My righteousness comes by faith, by grace in Jesus Christ. And that was, that's what protects my heart from being condemned. And I, I can shod my feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Everywhere I go, I'm on mission to give the peace of the gospel to everyone that I'm around. Number two, I take up the shield of faith that can quench all the fiery darts of the evil one. No matter who or what I come into contact with, I can trust greater is he who's in me than he who is in the world. And the shield of faith will quench the fiery attacks of Satan. Finally, or the last two, I can take up the helmet of salvation. My hope isn't in this world. My hope is not here, but my hope is in eternity. And my hope is that when I stand before Jesus Christ, I'm eternally justified because of what he's done for me. That I'm, I'm pure before God. Even though I may feel worthless, I'm not. I know that I'm valued because Jesus Christ died for me. Finally, the sword of the spirit, the word of God is your offense. Hide the word of God in your heart. Get it memorized so that when, when those situations come up, even if it's not word for word, paraphrase it, whatever it is, get the word of God in your heart so that you're ready to fight against Satan. And finally, verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So I encourage you this week, pray through that. Every morning, I guarantee you, your week will go a lot differently than it has in the past. So I want to close with this and pray um, for us. But it's in Psalm, um, I believe it's 19. I'll read this out of the NLT as well. But number one, we're not the victim. Christ has laid down his life for us. Number two, we're a soldier. We need to prepare every day to renew our minds. But number three, Romans 12 finishes with us. He says, discerning the good and perfect will of God. When you're dealing with hurts and hangups and habits that you're not addressing, your spiritual vision will be blurred. I'm telling you, man, you'll be believing all sorts of crazy things. You'll be believing people are judging you. And I've been there. I've I've been there. And it's a terrible place to be imprisoned Um, in your mind in that sense. And so we have to allow now, how do we get to this discernment in the Lord is becoming a living sacrifice, renewing our mind. But the third thing, which I know I've talked about a little bit, but I just want to emphasize again, is get in the word. Get in the word of God. In Psalm 19, I love this. And um, and the NLT says this, verse seven, the instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for the living. Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true, each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the comb. They are a warning to your servant, a great reward for those who obey them. There's a lot of benefits to reading the word of God. There's a lot of ways God's word can change our heart as we meditate and we hunger for it. So last thing as we close is as we become living sacrifice, we renew our mind, um, we get into the word of God, we prepare and all these different things. The last thing that we need is community. And that's partially why we're doing this series. That for me, it wasn't, all these things helped me, but I, I saw a Christian counselor. I talked to my doctor. I changed my workout routines. I changed my diet. There was a lot that I needed to do to find true healing in my heart. And so whether it's getting involved with the core classes, getting involved with discipleship, getting into CR, if you're dealing with something, please don't do it alone and don't suffer um, 
the, the mental prison of what um, past hurts can bring you into. Reach out for help. I know whether it's me or Pastor John or Ken and the elders, we'd all love to meet with you guys, sit down and talk to you if you've had um, some of these struggles with hurts and, and mental illness or addictions or whatever it is. So there's opportunities, not just on your own, in your own time with your relationship with God, but to take action together um, as a community. And I hope that you um, will take advantage of that. So I'm, I'm gonna ask um, the worship team um, to come up and we will... Um, begin to close our service here and I will pray. Um, Father God, thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, I just pray that you would teach us to be living sacrifices, which is our reasonable service and our response to your gospel. Lord, I just pray, God, that, um, Father, you would give us clear spiritual insight to see what is true and to be able to discern what is false and what is a lie. God, I pray that you would stir up the hearts of Mitchell Berean, God, that each person could find an avenue, whether it's the shape class or discipleship or celebrate recovery or whatever it might be, God, that they can get plugged in and they can truly be a light who's not hindered by their habits and their hangups and their hurts, but can live in freedom by the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord. So we thank you for all that you've done for us and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we want to end our service uh, with a song, but also a time of response. And so I just wonder if God's speaking into your heart about a number of these issues that Pastor Luke spoke about. Um, whether or not you're going through a crisis right now or not, um, the principles that are in this series are still applicable to all of us. It's something we've got to practice in order to grow. And so I wonder tonight if maybe one of those areas of surrender spoke into your heart. Maybe you need to surrender the desire to fix it. That's a hard one to surrender. Maybe you need to surrender some of those distractions. Maybe God's speaking into your heart about surrendering that self-medication dysfunction that you've been walking in for a while. Or maybe you need to surrender your version of the truth so you can accept God's. Um, if you need to respond, if you need to come forward for prayer, if you need to come forward to ask God um, to repent of those things, then I'd invite you during this last song to come up. I'm up here. I'd love to pray with you if you need that. But let's allow God to minister into our hearts. Let's respond to him with what he's speaking into us. So let's sing.
by the strength and the power of the Spirit within us. As we submit and surrender to you, will you help us to lead and live a holy life for your glory as a witness to this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Wonderful evening, church family. We'd love to see you at the River Float after the 11 o'clock service tomorrow. Have a wonderful week.